Wow, I gotta say, that was the best introduction I have ever written. That was just very nicely done. I really appreciate that. Welcome to Las Vegas, yes? How many people did not get enough sleep last night? I mean, let's be honest, we are here in Las Vegas. It is early in the morning. So what I want everybody to do is to turn the person next to you and give them a high five. Go, give the person next to you a high five. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. Eh. You don't know the secret of high fives? MIT studied high fives. The best way to give the best high five is to look at the other person's elbow when you are high fiving them. Make sure it's the elbow that they're high fiving you with, not the other elbow, people. Let's try it again. Turn to the person next to you, look at their elbow, give them a high five, go. Yes, listen to that sound. Fantastic. Now, turn to the person behind you and give them a high five, go. Turn to the person, oh wait, a hey. We magicians can be tricky guys. Some people weren't listening. That's OK. I was introduced as a mentalist. Not a lot of people know what that is. Some people were impressed by the fact that I was named the 2010 top mentalist in North America. Other people were like, wow, he must have beat out all six other guys. That's impressive. So rather than try to explain who a mentalist is and what they can do, I found it is best to simply demonstrate it. And the way that I demonstrate it is I take a baseball and I throw the baseball into the audience as hard as I can. <laughs> Be careful. This is a real baseball, okay? If it comes to you, catch it, all right? You can catch it with your hands or catch it with your face. I don't care, just catch the ball. Now, any good baseball pitcher would do the same thing when they sort of wind up and, and pitch. And the first thing they do is they lean in to get the sign. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll lean in for the sign. Yeah, thank you for that sign back there. <laughs> Wasn't quite the sign I was expecting when I came in. But again, welcome to Las Vegas. Let me get nice and close so this is extra fast for you guys. Here we go. And then they come to the set. They check the runners. I'm watching you. And then they give the wind up and the pitch. Ha! <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys couldn't see this. You guys couldn't see this. But I had a great view. Over here, they were like, wow, <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> baseball's over here, guys. Baseball's over here. Now, I have a very simple question for you. Who here is afraid of a piece of paper? Nobody, right? Unless you're a rock from the rock, paper, scissors game. <laughs> Paper poses no threat to you. So why is it that wherever I go in this country, wherever I go in the world, whenever I throw a piece of paper at the audience, everybody in this section freaks out. Their jaw drops open, their eyes bug out, and like a little bit of pee comes out. <laughs> Guys are like, how did he know? I thought I was safe with my jacket in my lap. He is a mentalist. That's impressive. For those who don't know, as a mentalist, I am not psychic. It's important to know that. I get accused of being psychic all the time after people see what I do. I'm not psycho either. I get accused of that as well. Neither of them are true. I don't read minds. I read people. I don't predict the future. I influence the present. I look at nonverbal communication, facial expression, uh, body language, and it gives me an idea of what someone is thinking. For example, I can already tell that guy thinks this is all a bunch of crap. <laughs> he's looking at me like, whatever, mental boy. I don't know. Actually, he's pretty good. He got me. He pegged me. I was skeptical at first, but he nailed it. I need to show you something now, people. I need to show you this now. Because later on, you're going to wonder, did he show us this before or after? And later on, when you're laying in bed tonight, awake, trying to figure out how this thing works, you're gonna know that I did show you before. In fact, you're sitting here, this is perfect. I'm gonna put it right here. Your job is to keep an eye on that deck of cards for the rest uh, of your life, okay? Fair enough? Easy job, right? Cool, your eyes are already here, I need you there. But that's okay, we'll work together as a team. All right, who caught the piece of paper? Where's the piece of paper closest to? You have it, fantastic. What is your name? Tina? That is correct. <laughs> it's a gift, people. It's a gift. Tina, I want you to focus on me. I don't want you to be nervous in any way. I know we've got a bunch of people here turned out for the MPI keynote. However, I want you to ignore everything that's going on over here and focus just on me for now. 
and I'm gonna have you make a simple choice. It's a number between one and 10, and go ahead and say it whenever you want. Louder? Seven. Seven. I need another person. In order to get another person, I need another piece of paper. I, um, I'll be honest, I accidentally threw the baseball once. I never got invited back to that nursing home, I'll tell you that right now. Here we go, curveball, let's see it. I'll even close my eyes and throw. Oh, it's bobbled, but yeah, don't all rush for it at once. <laughs> cool, and your name is? Angela. I'm sorry? Angela. Angela, really? Wow, my cousin's name is Beth. What a coincidence. <laughs> Angela, focus on me just for a moment here. I want you to ignore everything that's going on over here. Just focus here for now, just on this. And I want you to not be nervous, please. This is, we're all friends here, yes? Cool, that was so mediocre, Angela. <laughs> They're kind of like, yeah, I guess. I don't even know Angela, <laughs> but that's cool, we're, we're good. Uh, I'm gonna have you not name a number, but you're gonna name a shape, but it's gonna be either a club, a heart. You see where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, good. Uh, a heart, a spade, or a diamond. It's totally up to you. Please name your choice, Angela, now. Diamond. diamond. I need one more person. In order to get another person, I need a baseball. Just kidding, we'll use another piece of paper. Give me the knuckleball this time. Here we go. Oh boy. <laughs> I tried for distance, what did I get, the front row? Fantastic, all right, bounced off of you, went to you. All right, cool, what is your name? Corbin, Corbin. nice to meet you, Corbin. I have no jokes for that name. Focus on me for a second. I want you to choose uh, something simple, either upside down or right side up. Whichever's more appealing to you, go ahead and name your choice now. Right side up. Ladies and gentlemen, three random people, randomly selected by throwing things into the audience, have made three random selections. But the question I have for you is very simple. How amazed would you be if the seven of diamonds were inside that box right now? <laughs> huh? Right? How impressed would you be? You don't know if I'm playing with a full deck, people. This could be anything, right? All right, what is your name? Rich, fantastic job, Rich. You've been keeping an eye on this. Nobody's touched it at any point. Everybody else, we're going to take over Rich's job, OK? We're all going to stare at the cards. I'm about to touch them. I was doing this for an awards banquet one time. And uh, I said, we're all going to take over so-and-so's job. And one guy yelled out, yeah, we do that already. <laughs> Zing. All right, pay close attention. I'm going to do this in super slow motion. This is not about sleight of hand. There's nothing in my hands. This is super slow motion. I need you to pay careful attention. Magicians don't normally do that, do they? Magicians normally say, look over there, while they do the secret move over here. I want you to focus carefully, just as Rich did, and look for one card and one card only. Hopefully, you can see the seven of diamonds. Can anybody see that right here? Can you all see this? One card is a little different. I apologize about this. I'm going to take this. I'm going to put this right on the ground. I don't even want to touch it. <sighs> trying to find somebody without a laptop here. <laughs> That'll be your job. OK? Cool. In a moment, I'm going to have you make your way onto the stage. You're going to reach down and pick up that card and show the audience. If it is right, you'll know, because they will give you a wonderful IMEX round of applause. That sounds like this. Cool. However, if that's exactly right, if that is exactly the seven of diamonds, they are going to go crazy. And that sounds like this. Yeah. Oh, my arm. Oh, it hurts. Enough. All right, cool. You ready for your big moment? You excited? Cool. Make your way to the stage. Slow motion with drama and flair. <laughs> and a slight moonwalking motion. Turn around before you bend down, because that's a different show. <laughs> Pick up that card and show them if it is indeed the seven of diamonds. It is! And they're going crazy! Nicely done. High five. Yes, nobody's ever done it so well. You may have a seat and enjoy the rest of the program. All right. Any questions? Usually people have a question after I do that. 
Usually people want to know, how did you do that? And I am here to teach today, right? Normally this is a, an opener for my act, and I normally, again, get to perform for lots of cool events around the country and around the world. But for now, I want to take, take the, I want to, I, want to, I want to pull back the curtain a little bit and give you some insight into how I was able to do this. Now, the answer for how I do this, you guys ready? Very simple. I'm awesome. <laughs> That's how. All right, any other questions? Let's unpack this. Let's rewind the tape in our minds. I threw paper balls into the audience. Random people caught them. First one was you, yes? Now. I had you ignore everybody that's going on over here, and I had you to, uh, I said for you not to be nervous. What does that do to people when you tell them, don't be nervous? Makes them nervous. Now, maybe you weren't shaking in your boots, but at least your conscious mind was a little bit distracted so I could deal directly with your subconscious mind. When you tell people not to do something, it's amazing how quickly they do it, isn't it? Right? Reverse psychology, they call it. The subconscious part of the brain erases the word no or not. In fact, one time I was on a plane, 36,000 feet in the air, and I heard this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I just want to let you know there's absolutely no cause for concern. How do you think I felt? Concerned. I was looking at the wings, like, are they on fire? Like, why should I be concerned? For the rest of the flight, it's like, what was that sound, right? So when we tell people what not to do, it has the reverse effect sometimes. So we have to be real careful whenever in our communication we use negation. This time I used it on purpose, didn't I? Uh, by the way, I'm going to trick you all right now. I'm going to trick your brains right now. You ready? You ready for it? I'm, as, as a mentalist, I'm going to trick your brains. You know what I'm doing and when I'm doing it, but I want you to psych yourself up for it. You guys ready? Here we go. For the next 10 seconds, please, do not think of the word rhinoceros for the next 10 seconds. You know what? Don't even picture one. Okay? It's going to try to push its way into your brain, charge its way right in there. You just push it out. How are we doing? Not so good, right? I heard some terribles out there, right? Not so good. Why is this? You know, and by the way, how many people were successful not thinking rhinoceros? Okay, elephant? Yes? yes? Just checking. All right. We are predictable, aren't we? <laughs> so, why do we think rhinoceros? You guys are like, stop it. I can't stop thinking rhinoceros right now. Get out of my head, mental boy. There is a herd of rhinoceros in my head right now. <laughs> or a herd of rhinoceri. I don't know. What would you call a herd of rhinoceros? So if you don't believe that this works, by the way, when you get home after IMAX, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bust into your house and say, honey, I just want to let you know that I did not cheat on you. <laughs> didn't happen. How do you think their subconscious brain is going to react to that? Don't give me this technically crap. What happened, right? <laughs> don't do that when you get home. Don't do that. See that reverse psychology? It's always happening. So I said, don't be nervous. Focus on me. Ignore everything that's going on over here. I want you to choose a number between 1 and 10. Now, for me, it's between 1 and 10. That's my perspective. But for you, it's between 1 and 10. This is a bit of a lost art, ladies and gentlemen taking other people's perspective. Have you noticed that this is a dying art? It's a dying skill. And as magicians, we obsess over other people's perspective. We practice in front of a mirror for hours so we can see what you see. We get on stages just like this, and we put coaches in the audience, and they shout at us over and over again, watch your angles. Hey, hey, watch your angles. Watch your angles. We hear that all the time in magic. And that means don't forget about my perspective. As an illusionist, I need to create something that works for you and for you, and I must know what you see. I'm going to show you a graph. And if it has the same effect on you as it did on me, it is going to break your heart. This comes from Sarah Conrath. She's a research psychologist, and she has mapped out human empathy over the last 30 years. Human empathy over the last 30 years, ladies and gentlemen, looks like this. Whew. I don't know if you noticed, right around 2004, 2005, right around the time that social media has been real proliferated is when the biggest drop off is. You see, we're at a time in our history, we are more connected than ever before. The quantity of human connection is skyrocketing. We have devices in our pockets, many of you using them right now, to reach out and touch just about anybody on planet Earth. It's amazing. We live in an amazing time. But as the quantity of human connection has gone through the roof, what has happened to the quality? Have you noticed? 
have you noticed? Einstein says, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Have you noticed? We stare at a screen for an average of seven hours per day. And we have situations like this. A family seated around the table, all focused on their mobile devices. You see, we are not learning the ability of human connection and human interaction. We're simply not learning the skill anymore. And we're suffering because of it. You see, this is not just a skill that we want to have for our lives. We don't want to be able to connect with other people simply because it's a good thing to do as a human being. Right? And on our deathbeds, I will tell you this. When you're laying on your deathbed, you're not going to say to the people around you, hey, can you go um, back to my office, grab my college degree off my wall so I can hold it one last time. We're not going to say, bring me to the car in the garage so I can sit in my dream car for one last minute. We're not going to say, bring me back to the office for one last day of work. Right? We're not going to say these things. In that moment, when it really matters, we're going to ask for the people that we care about and the people that care about us, the relationships that we've established. And if relationships are going to be important then, shouldn't that be what's important now? Have you noticed? So my challenge today, my, what I'm excited about today, is to share with you some of the key interactions of how I'm able to interact and connect with the people around me. A number between 1 and 10. Rewind the tape in your mind. Rewind the tape on the camera. You'll remember me doing this. And I did this. And I want you to say it whenever you want. Number between 1 and 10, I want you to say it whenever you want. Great. Do you, you see what I'm doing here? With my, just, just watch my hands here. Number between 1 and 10, creating what we call a visual spatial reference. And I drew a 7 in the air with my hand. You guys catch this? From your perspective, right? And then I snap my fingers where? About at the 7. But here's the thing. I even said. Seven. Rewind the tape in your mind. Let's watch it back in slow motion this time. I want you to name a number between one and ten and say whenever you want. Heaven. Are you catching on? Yes? So we are incredibly influenceable, number one. But also, this is a little bit that, that really illustrates the power of the subconscious mind. Now, out of curiosity, I know that you just saw me explain that. But why did you feel like you chose seven? Lucky number, maybe. Just sort of popped into your head. Yeah? Angela, why, you kind of like it. It's like your favorite number, perhaps. Cool. Angela, why, uh, why diamonds? Because what, girl's best friend, is that what you said? There you go, right? All right, cool. So uh, this is the, all kinds of explanations that people give me for why they chose seven and why they chose diamonds. I chose seven because I have seven in my phone number. I chose seven because I live on seven Holloway Brook Road. I chose seven because seven is my favorite number. It's my lucky number. I have seven kids. I chose seven because of this. When the truth is we make all of our decisions based on emotion first subconsciously, and then we rationalize and justify those decisions consciously with logic. So that's why you chose seven. Over here, Angela's like, uh-uh. No way, mental boy. I make up my own decisions, thank you very much. So here's what I did for you, Angela. I had to read, and it's kind of difficult, low light, but I quickly gathered that you're the type of person who doesn't believe something just because somebody says it. You like to kind of have your own proof and kind of go your own way. In fact, when people try to push you, you tend to push back a little bit. You can't push Angela around, ladies and gentlemen. So what I did for you was I had to use another reverse kind of psychology technique. I said, I want you to choose either clubs. You see what I'm doing with my hands here? It's a kinesthetic action as though I'm holding a club. Or hearts. You see where I'm going with this? right? And I pointed to the deck of cards, and I pointed to Rich, and we had a laugh so I could say hearts again. Where was I? Hearts tapping into the auditory modality, making her brain think, he wants me to choose hearts. And then I drew a big spade in the air with my hands. You remember this? Rewind the tape in your mind. And then I said, I want you to make a choice now. But that spade tapped into her visual modality. If you want to communicate and connect with the people around you, you must use multiple modalities, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. But what did I do for diamonds, Angela? What did I do for diamonds? Nothing. Here's what's going on in her mind. Oh, clearly he wants me to choose clubs. Hearts, hearts, hearts. Obviously, he wants me to choose hearts. Speed up. Oh, forget him. I'm going diamonds. <laughs> and the reverse psychology works every 
time. Now over here, uh, I wanted you to choose. Uh, I wanted you to choose upside down. I truth truthfully did. I wanted you to choose upside down. I made an anchor. I said I want you to choose either upside down. That motion was an anchor, or right side up. Nothing. Whichever is more up. Appealing to you, tapping into the upside down anchor again, go ahead and name your choice now. And um, because you didn't pick up on these social clues, uh, all that means is that you are awkward. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, it, this just means that you think differently, and that's a, a quality skill to have. And in fact, a lot of people in this room probably think differently. In fact, many of you are wondering, mm -mm, no, I'm not buying it. Nope. Trick deck of cards, that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. He's got a remote control in his pocket. Yeah, 52 buttons on it. As soon as they name the card, he reaches to his pocket, pushes a button. Uh, a small gerbil runs out of his case and uh, flips over the card. I mean, Rich is not looking, obviously, so nobody's going to see that, right? And they make assumptions. So what I did was I sent the skeptical people a message. I sent you a message before we even started. Do you remember the message that I sent you? To prove that it's not a trick deck of cards, to prove that it's no gerbil in my case. Please open up the balls of paper that I threw into the audience. Please open up the balls of paper that I threw into the audience. And from the audience's perspective, if they hold it up nice and high, you will see that they read seven of diamonds, each and every one. Ladies and gentlemen, we are robots. <laughs> it's cool when it works. Now. The question is very, very simple. This is a magic trick, yes? We're in Las Vegas. Anything can happen, right? This is a magic trick. Clearly, there's got to be some kind of illusion involved. But in the real world, the question I have for my audience is, is real simple. Is it possible to connect with people in such a way that you can influence their thoughts, choices, behaviors, and actions? Is it possible to influence the thoughts, choices, behaviors, and actions of the people around us? Is it possible? Yes. You guys are like, apparently. <laughs> Good to have you in Vegas. Is it possible? And the answer is it's impossible in real life. It's impossible not to. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we don't do and don't say influences the brains of the people around us in a very neurochemical level and therefore affecting the thoughts, choices, behaviors, and actions. A lot of people want to learn how to do this. Salespeople want to learn how to influence their teams. Managers want to learn how to influence uh, excuse me, salespeople want to learn how to influence their prospects, excuse me. Managers want to learn how to influence their teams. Parents want to learn how to influence their children. And i got to say, we need more parents who can be an influential force in their kid's life. Would you agree? We need to learn the skills of influence. We need to learn how to connect with people in such a degree, because I'll tell you what, there are some managers too, maybe even here, who sometimes feel like their teams act like children. Right? You ever feel like you run a daycare center instead of an office? You ever feel like a babysitter instead of a boss? So with your permission, with the time that we have left here today, I would like to share with you the three biggest secret hidden keys to connect with the minds of the people around you. And the reason is because if you want to have influence, and that's why we're here, we're here to negotiate, we're here to network, we're here to influence. If we want to have true influence, that lasts. Not just that person who says, yeah, I'll do it. I'll get, yeah, the client and the prospect who says, we'll get back to you, but never follows through. Okay? You've only influenced them on a conscious level, not on a subconscious level. So with your permission, I would like to share with you the three keys to the one key. And the one key to truly, truly influencing the people around us is human connection. All things being equal, people do business with who they know, who they like, and who they trust. All things not being equal, people do business with who they know, who they like, and who they trust. Relationships are everything in business and in life. So again, with your permission, I would like to share with you the three hidden keys to human connection. Sound good? What do you think? Yes? Beautiful. I love you guys. No, really. I love you guys. That was awkward. There's a famous magician by the name of Howard Thurston, and before every show, before the curtain went up, he would stand behind it and say those words over and over again, I love my audience. I love my audience. I'm grateful for my audience. I'm thankful that they came to see my show so I can put food on my table. I love my audience. And he credits that practice with the success 
of his incredible, incredible career. Howard Thurston practiced the first key of human connection and the first key of human interaction, and that is perception. Is it possible that your thoughts could influence the outcomes of other people? Is it possible that how you perceive people, how you decide, uh, or, or what you decide about people influences their thoughts, choices, behaviors, and actions? Is that possible? Yeah. MIT says yes. MIT did a very famous study uh, where they, it's called Thin Slices of Negotiation. I don't know, anybody here going to be involved in any negotiations this week, possibly, per, by any chance, right? And what they found with Thin Slices of Negotiation was that the first five minutes of an interaction could predict the outcome of the negotiation, the first few moments. And what they looked for in those first few moments was the outward representation of the inward perception. Because there are some people that you interact with. You know those people where you just have a bad perception about them? Like you see them coming off at a distance, and already you're tired. You know what I mean? You hear their voice at the other end of the phone, and a small part of you dies on the inside. You know these people. That's not going to be a good outcome if you have that perception going in. MIT found with 80 plus percent accuracy, they can look at those first moments, gauge the perception of each individual, and determine who's going to win, come out on top of that negotiation. John Gottman followed suit. John Gottman studies married couples, though. Any married people in the house today? Yeah? Anybody know what the opposite of marriage is? Opposite of love? Let me ask you, if, if you're single, what's the opposite of love? What do people say the opposite of love is? Hate, right? If you're married, what's the opposite of love? Indifference, contempt, <laughs> marriage is the answer. <laughs> Some people say that. No, no, the truth is there is something that breaks apart marriages faster than anything else. John Gottman studied thousands of married couples, thousands of them in Seattle, his love lab, he called it. Analyzed all the data, video, in, video recorded every single interaction, looked at all their facial expressions, looked at all their body language, looked at all the words that they said. And then John Gottman took all that data and he cracked the code of marriage. He cracked the code. Here's what he can do now. And this puts mentalists like me to shame. He can look at any married couple and watch them for three to five minutes. That's all he needs, three to five minutes. And then he will be able to predict whether or not they will still be married 15 years from now. And he is over 90% accurate. That's amazing. What is he looking for? What is he looking for? Perception. He's looking for how they perceive each other. He said, there's one thing I look for. He boiled it down to a facial expression. Paul Ekman, he's the guy who discovered the micro expression. He's the guy the television show Lie to Me is based off of. Paul Ekman says this facial expression is the number one most dangerous human facial expression that we can make. And it's not rage. And it's not hate. John Gottman says, those are fine in a marriage. You can be angry with your partner, with your spouse. It's how you respond to that anger. This facial expression is the only facial expression that we make naturally that is asymmetrical. If you were to hook up people to medical equipment and show them photos of people making this facial expression, the medical equipment will know. Blood pressure and heart rate will fluctuate. Their immune systems will start to break down. Body temperature drops. The body starts to die a little bit on the inside from looking at a picture of a facial expression. Clearly, this is something important. Clearly, it has to do with our perception. I'm going to show you a photo of this facial expression. But please, do not look directly into his eyes. Otherwise, your bodies may start to fail. It looks a little bit like this. Many people characterize it by the eye roll. The eye roll is sometimes present. We really, the main characteristic is the sneer. One half of the mouth going up in a little bit of a sneer. Mm. It's saying to you this, please, please, How, don't even bring that around me. I am here and you are here. I am morally superior to you. And don't be bringing that around here. Please, right? Do you see how the perception of that person is way down here? And you see how that tears apart the human connection faster than anything else. So I want to leave you with some advice here. If there is a relationship that you care about, be it at work, 
that prospect that comes to be like, oh, I got to go do these hosted buyer meetings now. Oh, gosh. Man, this is so tough. These people, they're just tire kickers anyway. They're not going to buy anything. Uh. <laughs> Can't even fit them if we did. <laughs> if you have that perception going in, how's that interaction going to work out? Right? We must alter our perception and learn from Howard Thurston when we say, I love my audience. I'm so grateful for them. The antidote for contempt is gratitude. Gratitude. So I challenge you this week to be grateful for each interaction that we have. And grateful for each interruption. <laughs> <laughs> because if you feel that perception, you will, as Paul Ekman says, there's a technical term for this, you will leak contempt. It's called leakage. Your emotions leak onto your face. And other people's subconscious minds pick up on it and make decisions about you. So if that's what not to do, let's talk about what we should do. The second P, the second hidden key that I have for you, has to do with position. Position. In fact, I'm not here to teach you how to read body language today. That's not what this is about. You all know how to read body language. It was your first language. You're a gifted natural. You know how to read body language. But the question I have for you is, do you know how to speak body language? All day long, you're looking at other people. Very rarely do you get feedback on your own body language. Very rarely do people have positions like I do where I'm on film all the time and I can watch the footage back. So body language is the biggest communication tool that we have. According to Dr. Albert Morabian in 1967 at UCLA, he found that 55% of what we communicate is through our body language. It's the biggest chunk. 38% is our para language or our vocal tonality or how quickly we speak, our volume, all that stuff. And 7% of what we communicate is the words that we say. And this is coming from a guy who wrote a book called Magic Words. <laughs> Only 7% is the words that we say. That's why I wrote this book, because it's the seven words that defy that statistic. So the question I have for you is, do you speak effective body language? And the answer is, most people have no idea. We have no idea what our body language is doing. We have no idea the effect that we're having on the people around us. It's like taking the most powerful tool out of your toolbox, like, like a jackhammer, and just swinging it around, because you don't know how to use it, right? Just swinging it around wildly with no regard to the damage that you're causing or the people that you're hurting. So the question I have for you is, do we know how to speak effective body language? This is a survival mechanism. This is universal across cultures, across continents, across races and religions. Body language is the glue that holds us together as human beings because it boils down to our survival. Somebody walks into the room, we all turn and look, right? Ooh, because that's what we do, don't we? We do the Scooby-Doo, ooh, <laughs> and we look. This is, called, this is so that your brain can do a threat assessment. You can look at that person. You can analyze their body language. You can see how they're carrying themselves, how their hair is done, what clothes they're wearing, how they walk, what their voice sounds like. You analyze all of that, your subconscious mind, and then you spit out a report to your conscious mind. And you experience that report. How many of you have ever gotten a vibe? Your brain doesn't tell you how it came up with that answer. It just You're on a need-to-know basis with your brain, right? So it just comes up and says, all right, vibe, here it is. And the vibe is one of four things. Either it's good, you get a magnetic, charismatic attraction to that person. It's bad, it's the exact opposite. You're repelled from that person. And you've probably met people like that. You see them and you, it, ugh, they just rub you the wrong way, right? Or it's boring. That's the third option, boring. There's seven billion people on this planet. We can't have a strong emotional reaction to all of them. You're going to be walking down the strip, and you're going to see some interesting things. There's going to be a lot of boring stuff, though, too. Your brain will just ignore that. And the final one, which is important to your survival, but it's a topic for a different day, is sexy. So you're either come across as good, bad, boring, or sexy. Again, that's about survival of yourself and your species, right? One of those things. Which, one do you, which vibe do you give off? Which vibe do you give off with your family? Which vibe do you give off with your prospects? Which vibe do you give off with your clients? That's the question. And again, MIT found that the right vibe to give off is a vibe of confidence. I'm going to give you a quick crash course on how to speak confident body language. Are you ready? I'm going to give you a toes to nose crash course. But the first thing I want to do is I want to test your reading ability. So question, which is more confident, A 
or B? What do you think? A or B? B, instantly. Everybody knows. You all can read body language immediately. I just moved my foot slightly to the left, and suddenly it makes me more confident. What's going on here? With body language, little hinges swing big doors, and we need to be very aware of what our body is doing. What's the first part of the body that I look at when I'm uh, reading somebody's body language? Please uh, keep it clean. <laughs> hands, eyes. What else? These are very important. I can tell a lot about people by their hands and their eyes, especially eyes. You can tell a lot about somebody by pupillary dilation, eye movement, how much sclera they're showing, orbicularis oculi, all that stuff we look at, but I don't start there. Smile, good mouth, face, good, that's, that's important. I don't start there either. Shoulders, posture, these are all good answers, but the answer I'm looking for is feet. I start at your feet. Your feet are your most honest body part. Your feet tell me what you're really thinking. Where your feet are pointing is where you want to go. The reason your feet are so honest is because they're so closely tied to your survival. If you see a bear in the woods, what are you going to do? Right? right? Feet are important for that. Actually, the first thing you do is freeze, isn't it? <laughs> That's your subconscious brain taking over, commandeering your brain, saying, no, don't move. I got this. It freezes your blood, makes it so you can't even scream. It takes over your body. Have you ever had that? You ever been frozen by fear? Right? A lot of people experience that when public speaking or when giving presentations or whatever. They feel frozen by fear. And that's because we know that predators can detect motion better than anything else. So if you just stay put, it gives you the best chance of survival. For me, I don't have to freeze. All I have to do is just turn sideways. Let me just hide behind this twig over here, and I will be safe from the bear because I'll be invisible. <laughs> then the bear sees you and runs at you. Now what? Now you run, and it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. You're not going to outrun a bear, right? But you don't have to. All you have to do is outrun whoever you're with. <laughs> I can outrun my eight-year-old, no problem. I mean, we've tried. It's easy. <laughs> That's terrible. Then the bear catches you. Now what? What's your last resort? Fight, right? Or play dead. Go back to freeze, right? But in that moment, like if the bear is attacking your three-year-old, you're not going to be like, oh, honey, play dead. Play dead, honey. Yeah, he'll leave you alone in three to five minutes. Just don't, you know, don't breathe. No, you don't do that. You jump on the bear's back. You gouge its eyes. You kick its face. You do whatever you can to protect the survival of yourself and your species. Your brain prioritizes where your feet are. Very often, it doesn't even tell you about them. How often throughout the day are you thinking about your feet? Not very often. Your conscious mind is unnecessary for that, because in the wild, it's move or die. It's not see a bear and let's process this. Let's think about, let's weigh the pros and the cons of running. No, move or die. In the business world, this happens all the time. Let's say you're walking out of, a, let's say I'm Mr. Big Boss CEO, man, and I'm walking out, uh, and the door's right here, and I'm going, go, and then you stop me, and you say, excuse me, sir. I uh, have a wonderful timeshare opportunity I'd like to tell you about. And I'm very polite, and I turn, and I face, and I'm smiling, and I'm friendly. But where are my feet pointing? Out the door. Where do I want to go? Out the door. You'll also see this on the dating scene, won't you? <laughs> Look for it out on the strip, ladies and gentlemen, because you will see. You will see this. I promise you. Yeah, I just walk off stage. That's what usually happens on the dating scene for me. I just run away. Pretty girl sitting at the bar, right? Um, I will play the role of pretty girl today. She's talking to her friend. She's like, oh my gosh, shut up. Oh my gosh, shut up. I can't even. <laughs> then, <laughs> super handsome stud walks up to her and uses one of those cheesy pickup lines, like the cheesy ones. You know the ones I'm talking about? Like, did it hurt when you fell from heaven? <laughs> if I invented the alphabet, I would have put you and I together. Are you Jewish? Because you is really hot. <laughs> Are you from Memphis? Because you're the only 10 I see. <laughs> Some of them are bad, though, aren't they? Like, they cross a line. Like, do you wash your pants in Windex? Because I can see myself in them. I'm like, who says that? <laughs> That's terrible. You guys are like, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> this is gold. Glad I came. Glad I came. Hey, baby, I put the STD in stud. <laughs> and 
all I need is you. Who says that? <laughs> Who says that? But seriously, let's say he walks up to her and says, hey, baby, my name is Tim. And when you catch your breath, you can tell me yours. <laughs> I could never say that with a straight face. Like, I could never pull that off. You know what I mean? I'm not one of those, like, oh, take your breath away kind of guys. And I know that because there was never a song written that sounded like this. Don't you wish your boyfriend was scrawny like me? <laughs> Don't you wish your boyfriend was pale like me with bushy eyebrows? I just know it doesn't happen, right? Actually, I had a friend of mine, he'd get, he'd get me a t-shirt that said, chicks dig scrawny pale guys. And he thought it would make me feel better, but it didn't. Because <laughs> whenever I wore that shirt, pretty girls would just walk up to me and say, no, they don't. <laughs> like, eh, eh. Sometimes people get upset when I make fun of myself for being so skinny, so please, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable in it. You don't have to worry. Sometimes people come up and say, you should make fun of yourself for being so thin. I, I wish I was as skinny as you. And I don't know how to respond to that. What am I supposed to say? Like, oh, no, no, I, I wish I was as fat as you. Like, uh, honestly. <laughs> One time, I actually got a little inappropriate. It's like, somebody, somebody said to me, I wish I was as skinny as you. And I said, you know what? I really don't need to hear that, OK? Little girl. <laughs> and then I stepped on an ant, and it lived. It was embarrassing. <laughs> so he says the pickup line, and she looks, and she smiles. But where are her feet pointing? away from creepy stalker dude, right? And they're doing the foot bounce. He's dead, he has no chance right now, no chance, because that's her feet preparing her for escape. They're like, okay, whatever you need, just say the word and we go, come on, I will carry you to safety. <laughs> when you are dealing with people, when you are communicating with people, where should your feet be pointing? Towards them, with very rare exception with very rare exception. While networking, you don't want to corner people. You don't want to walk up to somebody and just stick their feet, your feet in their face and be like, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Tim. I'm so pleased you're here. And no, you want to do something a little bit different. You want to point one foot towards them and one foot at a 45 degree angle. This invites other people to come over and join the conversation. That's what networking is. You want to connect with as many people as possible, but you're still giving them your focus and your attention and your presence. Very important. In a sales situation, you don't walk up to somebody if you're a car salesperson and go on a car lot, because uh, I do a ton of sales trainings and, and sales you know, meetings and things like that and conventions, uh, you know, conferences. And you know, I tell people, don't walk up to your prospect and say, hi, how can I help you? So glad you're here today. No, they feel cornered, and they feel like, how can I get away from the salesperson as quickly as possible? But if you're almost kind of walking past them, pointing one foot towards them, maybe touch them on the shoulder a little bit, create a little bit of a compliance bond. Say, is somebody helping you? Right? All right, that's feet. We're going to go a little bit quicker here. You want it to be shoulder width apart, facing the person that you're speaking with in most circumstances. Leaning slightly forward without being a close talker. <laughs> if you don't know what a close talker is, you are one. <laughs> Back up. It's about survival. If I can reach out and grab you, I'm a threat to your survival. And your, you know, your, your subconscious brain gets a little upset. Shoulder width apart. Because we know that A is not as confident as B. But what about C? <laughs> Elbows bent 90 degrees at your waist. Hands making open palm symmetrical gestures. Number one thing that you can show to show confidence, which is the number one emotion that you want to show at the beginning of an interaction, is open palms. It's vulnerability. Subconscious brain knows that vulnerability equals confidence. Conscious brain thinks that strength is confidence. Not true. Vulnerability is confidence. If you see that bear in the woods, you're not going to be like this. Hey, bear. Here are all my vital organs. No, very often you'll probably blade, which is turning your body away, right? You may even cross your arms, like, you know, protecting all those vital organs. You ever, ever see somebody who doesn't like you? What are they doing? They look like a six-year-old in timeout. They're protecting their vital organs from that idea that they don't like. Showing the palms of your hands. So if you're not gesturing, and don't go crazy with symmetry, guys. Don't be like, okay, thank you all for coming to our meeting today. As you can see behind me, we have this and this. Just avoid obvious asymmetry. One hand jammed in the pocket while the other hand is gesticulating wildly. One half shrug. 
Be real careful of those types of things. So ladies and gentlemen, this is telling me that we are getting a little low on time. And I want to share with you some more stuff. So let's finish this out real quick. Tuck your chin slightly. Make eye contact with the person. Too far down, everything's a question. Too far up, what now? OK? Inverted half steeple is the position you want as a default. This is your crash course in body language. It's called magic pose. And I know that as I walk around the floor, I'm going to see a lot of people like this. <laughs> Genuine Duchenne smile and an eyebrow flash when you first see people. Looks like this. Huh. Once, all right, don't do this. <laughs> so what I've done is I've shared with you three things today. We talked about your perception. We've talked about your position. And we mentioned the words that you say. These are the three keys to connecting with the people around us. And before we go, I want to close with this. And just as a quick, quick aside, I just want to thank uh, all of you, first of all, for being here, for your presence. I know there's a lot going on outside these doors. You are here with me today. We have the ability with our devices. You are here today. Thank you for that. The second thing is I want to thank our sponsor, the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, if you guys are having fun, give a big round of applause for the PHLCVB. <laughs> Fantastic. So the final thought that I have for you is a poem that I've written. And if we can pull this up on the iMag, I want to make sure you guys can see this. It's less than two minutes. Make sure you stick around for the end. The poem is entitled, My Connection. Nothing is more valuable than my phone. I don't need face-to-face -face interaction. I've realized I crave digital consumption more than human connection. What matters is my perspective versus your perspective. Things are not how they used to be. I've learned that people aren't concerned about empathy. The average person is definitely staring at a screen for seven hours per day. The best things in life aren't happening later. Things need to happen now. We can't make change in this world. We can't make change in this world. Later. Things need to happen now. The best things in life aren't happening staring at a screen for seven hours per day. The average person is definitely concerned about empathy. I've learned that people aren't how they used to be. Things are not your perspective versus my perspective. What matters is human connection. More than digital consumption. I've realized I crave face-to-face -face interaction. I don't need my phone. Nothing is more important than human connection.